The Aborigines were deemed to be subhuman, little more than animals, which was to justify not only the theft of their land, but their extermination. An edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica, still in circulation when I was at school, described them as only an animal of prey, more ferocious than the leopard or the hyena, he devours his own species. So they were hunted and raped and massacred. And few doubted at the time that genocide was official policy. A government report in the 1850s spoke of the success of poisoning Aborigines, 100 of them laid out at a time. But until quite recently, little of this was even acknowledged. In Tasmania, the Aborigines were said to have died out. In fact, they were hunted along with kangaroos and almost wiped out. In New South Wales, by 1845, the tribe who had watched Captain Cook sail here into Botany Bay was reduced to three women and a man. In Victoria, an Aborigine called old Mr. Burt recalled this story told by his mother. They buried our babies with only their heads above the ground. All in a row they were. Then they had a test to see who could kick the baby's heads off the furthest. One man clobbered a baby's head off from horseback. They then spent most of the day raping the women. Most of them were then tortured to death by sticking sharp things like spears up their vaginas until they died. They tied the men's hands behind their backs, then cut off their penis and testicles and watched them run around screaming until they died. One of the most enduring myths about the Aborigines is that they did not fight back. In fact, a war of resistance lasted more than a century, some of it here on the banks of the Hawkesbury River, north of Sydney. During the 1930s, my father built a cottage here on the beach at an Aboriginal place called Patonga. I think we knew that somebody had lived at Patonga at some time, but no one talked about it. In fact, an entire nation had lived here on and off for thousands of years. They were called the Jurag, a unique Aboriginal people, tall and slender, whose country extended to a 40-mile radius north of Sydney, and the mighty Hawkesbury River was theirs. And when the British established the town of Windsor in the early 1800s, a great war began. This war was not recorded in the Imperial Chronicles of Australia. Growing up here, I knew nothing about it, and I suspect that's still true of the people in the smart beach houses here today. And yet the Durag inflicted on the British a casualty rate greater than that sustained by the Australian Armed Forces during all of World War II. And finally, after 22 years, outnumbered and without guns, they went down fighting to the last man, woman and child, a complete nation. Today, in a land of many cenotaphs and war memorials, on which invariably is written, lest we forget, not one of them stands for those who fought and fell in their own country. By the 1920s, the British invasion had caused the deaths of at least a quarter of a million black Australians. Genocide on a massive scale. But this fact remained suppressed, except in the living memory of those who survived. Here in the Northern Territory, in the great isolated heartland of Australia, the killing of Aborigines continued well into the 20th century, and most of these also remained secret. However, in 1928, 150 miles from Alice Springs, a gang of police and cattlemen massacred at least 50 Aborigines, perhaps many more, and word got out. A public inquiry was held, and its findings were summarized in these three words. The shooting was justified. In giving evidence, Constable William Murray said, we shot to kill. What use is a wounded black fellow?